few individuals have had a bigger impact on the libertarian movement than David Bowes, the longtime executive vice president of the Cato Institute. Bowes recently turned 70 and gave a keynote address in Washington, D.C. at LibertyCon, the annual gathering of students for liberty. I caught up with him to discuss disarray in the libertarian movement, why he thinks the non-aggression principle and cosmopolitanism form the core of the movement, why libertarians can never seem to take wins when we get them, and whether there's anything to look forward to in a rematch of Presidents Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Here is The Reason Interview with David Bowes. David Bones, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks for having me. Uh, you turned 70 uh, recently. You've been in the libertarian movement for pretty much, or conservative and libertarian movement for pretty much half a century. Yep. Can I ask, like right now, January, February, tw or February 2024, what's your assessment of how libertarian ideas and the libertarian movement is doing? Well, I think there are a lot more libertarian ideas. You know, when I was in college and thought of myself as a libertarian, but also thought of libertarians as part of the conservative movement, mm -hmm. um, who do we have as intellectuals? Hayek and, and uh, Friedman and Mises, I guess, briefly yeah. while I was in college. What about Ayn Rand in the mix there? Or Well, uh, yes, mm -hmm. yes. We, we read Ayn Rand. I'm and thinking you were of, at Vanderbilt? I was at Vanderbilt. what years was this? Uh, 71 to 75. Okay. So it was, it was kind of a good set of years there yeah. because um, Hayek won the Nobel Prize in right. 74, which was stunning to us because yeah. even as naive college students, we knew nobody like that had won a Nobel Prize before. Um, and then I think it was pretty surprising to him too, right? And Gunnar Myrdal, who he had to choke it down with, right? And then in 1975, Nozick won the National Book Award, mm -hmm. which really helped to put libertarianism on the map mm -hmm. of political philosophers and so on. Um, and then in 1976, Friedman won the Nobel yeah. Prize. I was out of college then, but that period really boosted libertarian sort of academic uh, credentials. Mm -hmm. And so these days, we kind of, just like everybody says, we have nobody like Reagan and Thatcher, mm -hmm. but in the time of Reagan and Thatcher, they said, where are the people like Churchill and Roosevelt? Right. Um, I look back and say, wow, weren't those great? And who is, who is that today? But at least one answer is there's a lot more libertarian intellectuals today. Yeah. And so maybe nobody is a Hayek these days, um, but there's definitely a lot more libertarianism in the academy, yeah. um, more libertarian intellectuals, more people reading those people. Some mm -hmm. of them even get published by major publishers. So... There's more of that, and I think that means there's more people who think of themselves as libertarians. Right. Well, I'm you guys, Cato, I haven't updated this in a while, but I mean, looking at kind of polls or surveys of people, plausibly we can say, what, 5 to 15 percent of the population is libertarian-ish? Libertarian-ish, or fiscally conservative, socially tolerant. Yeah. Um, we did, we looked at polls, and then we did one poll up to 2012 or 2014, and then when Trump came along, it, it upset all these yeah. lines, and so we never did another one. I think I was partly afraid we would find out the fiscally conservative, socially tolerant people voted for Trump, and I would mm -hmm. not have wanted to publish that. Really? Um, what, how do you define, what's the essence of libertarianism for you? Well, to me, the essence of libertarianism is the non-aggression principle. Mm -hmm. You have no right to initiate force against people who have not initiated force against you. And from that comes freedom of speech, freedom of religion, mm -hmm. freedom of property and markets, um, and ideally is set within a ethos of cosmopolitanism and mm -hmm. pluralism and tolerance. At that point, we're kind of talking about liberalism. Mm -hmm. And these days, I'm worried not just about libertarianism, but about yeah. liberalism. We're keeping it within the, the broad libertarian movement, you know, are, does that put you at odds with groups like the Mises Institute? Yes. Uh, okay. And can, is it fundamentally, because they'll say, hey, you know what, we're talking about the non-aggression principle. That's all, that's the only thing that matters. 
And is that part of the problem? Is that for you, it's the non-aggression principle, but this larger cosmopolitanism? Yes, and the fact that the Mises Institute has spent 40 years associating libertarianism and Austrian economics with the Confederacy Mm -hmm. and not so much on the Mises site, on the site founded by the Mises Institute's founder, um, you find genuine racist stuff. Well, uh, you're talking about LouRockwell.com. Yes. What is an example of the genuine racist? Stuff? Oh, um, there was there was a piece just a couple of days ago, like why aren't white people fighting for white people? Yeah. Um, so all that kind of stuff. Um, Do you consider yourself white? <laughs> I, well, I'm, I'm a first-generation white person, I think, because my mother was Italian. And you are. She was kind of... Eh. One of my colleagues at Cato for a while was really into ancestry and DAR <laughs> and things, and she brought me a printout of my entire ancestry going back eight generations. I always knew my eighth generation Bose ancestor came from Scotland. Okay, so, you know, we're Scottish. Yeah. But I also realized that's actually only one sixty-fourth of my genetic yeah. inheritance. So she presents me with these papers, and every single one of my ancestors at the eighth generation came from the British Isles to America before the American Revolution. Wow. So I am old stock, baby. You uh, grew up in Kentucky. Yes. So, and th- it, that puts you, when you talk about the Confederacy, that's interesting because Kentucky was a slave state, but it stayed in the Union. Yeah, that's so right. Is there, so are you just fighting the battles of your ancestors then? When you well, were- I don't think so. Um, I was in maybe junior high school during the centennial of the Civil War, mm-hmm. and so there was a lot of talk about that. Yeah. And I certainly heard things like no farmer would beat a slave to death any more than he would beat a prized bill to death. Mm-hmm. So that was a sort of underlying. Pretty humane then, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was pretty yeah. underlying attitude there, and I had to grow out of that, and it took a while. Yeah. Um, and Kentucky has more statues of Jefferson Davis, right, than like any other state. I, I didn't know that, but it's I, possible. I think That's where he was born. Right. Uh, although he then was a senator from Mississippi and yes. was the president of the Confederacy. Do you think it's? Um, and I remember a piece that you and uh, and. Um, uh, Jacob Hornberger of the Future of Freedom Foundation uh, in the pages of Reason debated, and you know this is a larger debate that's taken place in many venues and uh, many times. You are very critical of libertarians who cast back to the 19th century as a that was the goal, that was the golden age, and we we kind of screwed it up. Well, yes, um, certainly before the Civil War. Yeah. No golden age, four million people held in chains. Right. Um, after the Civil War, less obvious things, but there was Jim Crow. Mm-hmm. There were restrictions on women's rights. Um, not even anybody even thought about restricting gay rights. They just were. Yeah. Um, so a lot of libertarians think libertarianism is about cutting government spending. Mm-hmm. Less regulation, less spending, and I'm absolutely for those things. But as I've gotten older, I think I've gotten a greater appreciation for people who maybe were left out of the uh, consensus about markets and so on uh, to begin with and more uh, interested in the values of cosmopolitanism and tolerance. Can we talk? A little bit more about cosmopolitanism. So it's cosmopolitanism, tolerance, pluralism. Where do those come from, and why should those be adjacent to you know to if the if, you know the the nuclear core is the non-aggression principle? Why should it be? You know, I, I don't know nuclear engineering, so I'm going to blow the metaphor here. But like, you know, if if we're in we're in libertarian Chernobyl. Non-aggression principle is the reactor. Why is the housing cosmopolitan? Well, I think libertarianism is um, set within liberalism, classical Mm -hmm. liberalism. And I sort of think of libertarianism as the the intellectual core of liberalism, Mm -hmm. the intellectual vanguard, I'd like to think. Uh, I often say I'd like to be part of a libertarian intellectual vanguard leading a broader liberal movement. And that, 
for my whole career, we haven't had that. We've had Mm -hmm. liberals divided into people who emphasize free markets and people who emphasize civil liberties Mm -hmm. um, and tolerance and equality under the law for all. Libertarians have not had a great record on equality uh, under the law for all, although I think it's clearly inherent in what we believe. Right. But you didn't see many libertarians involved in the civil rights movement, right. critical of Jim Crow, and they should have been, and yeah. they should have been out there. How, how much do you is, I, and I'm thinking uh, our mutual uh, friend Penn Gillette, I read an interview with him recently, and you know I talked to him a few years ago. He no longer calls himself libertarian. And in this uh, interview with Cracked Magazine, or, or the website, which is a very good website, but the interview... The interviewer said, you know, like, is libertarianism just a bunch of rich white guys? And he was like, yeah, that's part of its limitation. Do you does is this part of what you're talking about? Yeah, it's probably part of it. Um, It has been mostly white guys. I Mm -hmm. think most intellectual vanguards over the years have been mostly white guys. Mm -hmm. Um, Libertarianism maybe hasn't changed as much. I don't think it's just self-interest. I know of rich white guy libertarians who have argued against their own direct self-interest on tariffs and things Mm -hmm. like that. Back when I was in uh, the Council for a Competitive Economy, which was an attempt to create a libertarian business group, there was a car dealer in California um, who flew to Washington to testify against tariffs on foreign cars. Hmm. Um, And I've known other uh, successful libertarian Hmm. manufacturers who have resisted. Uh, Bill Niskanen, maybe not exactly a rich white guy, you know, he was an economist. He was very white. Very white. He was Finnish. Um, He left Ford Motor Company Hmm. because he would not uh, defend tariffs when the Automobile yeah. companies kind of switched on that. What do you do? You think? I mean, the libertarian movement, the one that you helped build, the one that um, you know, they're going to have to kick me out of, uh, the one that the guys filming, and they are guys right now filming, white guys filming this. Um, you know, is it is it just a sociological artifact that you know this started in the '60s for the most part? I mean, there's longer historical roots. And it's just it appealed to people who were not motivated towards uh, the civil rights movement, were not motivated towards the women's right movement, maybe in the 70s started more in the gay liberation movement and things like that. But, um, you know, where where does the lack of engagement with things like the Civil Rights Act and Jim Crow come from? Well, I think I, I think it's true that libertarians in the United States um, have focused much more on economic issues, mm-hmm. property rights and free markets, deregulation, uh, government spending. Mm-hmm. Anytime I give a speech to libertarians, they want to know how do we stop this tide of government spending. Right. And there are a lot of other things they could ask about, but they tend to ask about that. Mm-hmm. Um, one difference, I'll tell you, uh, like in the 70s, was libertarians were ahead of everybody else on gay rights. Mm-hmm. 1972 platform, I yep. think, endorsed gay rights yeah. in some language, language that I think implied marriage equality, although right. they may not have realized they were implying and, that. And this is at a time when you know the American Psychological Association was still classifying being homosexual yes. as a mental illness. Uh, you know, I mean, it was decades before, you know, people like Bill Clinton, I guess, never really did when he was in office. But Barack Obama, you know, it took decades for leading Democratic, liberal Democratic candidate or president. Absolutely. To, and not yeah. just not just politicians, but the liberal media were right. not there. The New York Times ran some horrifying headlines, probably not mm-hmm. in the 70s, but back in the 60s, 50s, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, one difference there was there weren't many black libertarians who Mm -hmm. might have dragged some other libertarians into the civil rights movement. There were gay libertarians, and it was at a time when gay people were starting to feel they could come out, Mm -hmm. and maybe libertarian gay people more than others because, you know, they're libertarians and they're a little outside the mainstream anyway, um, and they get it. Um, 
And so, therefore, from very early on, there were gay people involved very much in the libertarian movement, and they at least pushed some libertarians to be aware of those issues right. in a way there hadn't been anybody to push libertarians to look at Jim Crow. So what about uh, women's issues, women's lib? Because, you know, one of the ironies of the libertarian movement, and, and this has changed in the 30 years I've been involved in the, in the movement as a movement. There are many more women, many, uh, not just, you know, there are many more women in the rank and file as well as kind of in leadership positions. But, you know, there's that irony that you have people like Rose Wilder Lane and Isabel Patterson and, of course, Ayn Rand in the 40s kind of creating, in many ways, the, the beginning of the modern libertarian yep. movement. And then it's like, yeah, and it's a bunch of, uh, you know, engineers uh, in sweaty basements for the next 60, 70 years. Well, they were the ones who read Ayn Rand. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's a sense in which if you talk to some feminists at least, mm -hmm about the difference in feminine and masculine ways of thinking. I remember reading, um, I think it was a well-known author, but I don't want to try to name. Carol who, Gilligan, well, perhaps? Hmm? Carol Gilligan? I was going to say Carol Tavris. Is that a name? I don't I'm know. I'm not sure. Yeah. Anyway, um, women are more about sharing mm -hmm. and including and things yeah. like that, and men are more about defining rights and mm -hmm. so on. And I thought, yeah, I can see that. I, I, it makes sense. She talked about what games yeah. boys and girls play. Right. Um, and by that standard, Ayn Rand was probably the most masculine thinking oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, writer, even though she's our woman on display. Yeah. She's um, much more, I always think of her in, in the 50s in concert with Jack Kerouac because they're kind of similarities and a lot of differences. He's much more female in terms, he's very emotional mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and oversharing, where she's much yeah. more rationalistic. Well, I do think Isabel Patterson, Rose Wilder Lane, yeah. and Ayn Rand all publishing books in one year. Mm -hmm. um, John Chamberlain wrote about, why was it women who did this? Why weren't there men speaking up against the Roosevelt administration and everything? Um, and I think that's a good question. Of course, it was basically only three women. There were a few others. Yep. Vivian Kellams was a tax rebel. Um, so so it may just be that there were three one-off uh, um, yeah. one-time heroes. Yeah, it might be that we search for patterns, and it's really mostly coincidences, right, or yeah. accidents. Um, to stay on civil rights issues for a while, one of the, you know, one of the, the kind of uh, Maginot lines, boy, I'm really screwing the, uh, I guess I could call it the color line or the Mason-Dixon line or something, but in libertarian thinking about the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, and this is, you know, I know a lot of people who, uh, of a certain age, who were kind of activated into politics by Barry Goldwater, and Barry Goldwater, who had voted for all sorts of civil rights laws, uh, when he was running for president in 64, he said, no, that's too far because it takes uh, the government into private business associations. Um, and that helps also explain, I mean, it wasn't simply libertarians. The Republican Party lost black voters en masse after that. I mean, I think Nixon in 1960 got something like 30 or 35 percent of the vote. People like Jackie Robinson campaigned for him and then was done with the Republican Party. Um, is Goldwater right, or is the way that libertarians conceived of the Civil Rights Act in error? Well, as a non-aggression principle libertarian, I do think people have a right to make in their private lives, mm -hmm. including their commercial business lives, uh, decisions that are mutually acceptable. So I want to rent from you. You want to rent to me. Um, you want to hire me at this price, I would prefer to be hired at this price. Hopefully we find a, uh, a number that works right. for both of us. But if we don't, then no contract is made. Um, there was a flurry of discussion of this um, a few years ago, and I was partially persuaded by libertarian arguments that you were overcoming 250 years of slavery and then, what, 75 years of Jim Crow and 
you can't just say, okay, now everybody's equal, everybody's free. Uh, you need some kind of reparation in a way, right. like saying you cannot discriminate in hiring. Right. Uh, you cannot discriminate in housing. And I get that. Theoretically, I'm not for it. As a practical matter, I can see it. I think a lot of the things that were predicted did not come true. Some of the things that were predicted did, that like, they kept going beyond that, like to affirmative action, mm -hmm. and then eventually to uh, quotas, mm -hmm. and eventually to identity groups. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a friend whose kids in, uh, um, I guess, junior high. They call it middle school now. Yeah, yeah. They were assigned to groups within the school on the basis of their color. Mm -hmm. And so, there, you know, so there's a black student union and there's a Hispanic student union or whatever. And his kids, despite actually having a Latino last name, but being mm -hmm. about three quarters mm -hmm. Anglo, um, were assigned to the White Alliance. Can you, can you imagine a worse yeah. name? That it's like a Nazi like a, name. Yeah, it's like a prison gang or right. something like that. That's amazing. What was it like going to Vanderbilt in the early 70s? Vanderbilt was, you know, the Harvard of the South. Uh, and you know, during uh, the, a number of the uh, literary and cultural critics called the Fugitives were there and around. And they were trying to, I mean, they were anti-modernity they were trying to maintain a Southern heritage. Most of them were trying to kind of figure a way, how do you airbrush out slavery and things like that. But what was what was Vanderbilt like in the early 70s? Well, the fugitive poets are in the 20s, mm -hmm. so right. I didn't know them. Okay. Um, there was, I think, one English professor on campus said to be sort of a the heir mm -hmm. um, representative of the fugitive poets, mm -hmm. um, or the um, there was another term that they used. Um, but I never took the a class from The agrarians, I think, right? Yes, yeah. Southern agrarians. Yeah, because right. in 1930, they put together a collection called I'll Take My Stand, which was essays on Southern culture. Right. So as Robert a Southerner, I'm like romantically attracted to that. Yeah. I'm also romantically attracted to the notion of Bonnie Prince Charlie. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he did kind of want to impose Catholic tyranny on England. Yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't technically have thought it was a good idea for him to to get back in power. Um, and that's sort of the way I would see the Southern mm -hmm. agrarians. Their ideas are wrong. Some of them are rooted in a nostalgia for the mm -hmm. Old South that I can appreciate. The problem is the whole nostalgia for the Old South, you know what the Old South was, right. and probably wasn't that great for a lot of poor white people. Mm -hmm. um, if you had a mansion and a plantation, then maybe yeah. a pretty good life. Um, so I don't think they had a lot of influence at mm -hmm. Vanderbilt at the mm -hmm. time. Vanderbilt was going through some of the things that other campuses mm -hmm. were going through in the 70s, but in a milder form. Mm -hmm. The Grateful Dead played on the lawn. <laughs> um, there were anti-war marches. Mm -hmm. uh, there were streakers. Yeah. Um, and there was some intellectual ferment. There was a... Uh, uh, basically a conservative magazine, mm -hmm. but pretty libertarian because me and my friends were running it. Yeah. Um, and there was also an Did object... Did it have a terrible name? No, it had a great name. Okay. It was called the Freedom Writer. <laughs> and if you're in the South, that kind of elides yeah. into Freedom Writer. Right. Um, and then for a while, there was an objectivist tabloid mm. um, printed on campus and our group of libertarian conservatives mm -hmm. discovered that in the dormitory, which was um, on each floor, there were four suites of six. We discovered that right across the hall from us was the suite of the people who were putting together this objective mm -hmm. newsletter. And we went over and said, hey, you know, we're the Freedom Writer people. And they're like, close the door in our face yeah, because they were doctrinaire objectivists. And I think eventually they would hang out in the hall and discuss girls, but not not ideas. What was, you know, you, you had mentioned that you kind of started out in conservative politics or, or that libertarianism was seen as a kind of subset of conservative politics. How, how did it become its own thing for you and for the movement? Well, uh, I think it was partly just that as it grew, 
there were more people who wanted to be separate. There have been several separations, you know. Mm -hmm. There was the 1969 uh, YAF convention and right. then the founding of SIL and that was supposed to be separate and then there was the 1972 founding of the Libertarian right. Party we we're declaring our independence from the Republicans but we always it's that property rights free markets mm -hmm. deregulation that keeps drawing us back um, so that's I, I think that's been a problem mm -hmm. uh, but there were the Rothbardians wanted not to be conservatives, mm -hmm. partly because they were very anti-war. Yeah. Even they weren't. Were you anti-Vietnam War? My first published article when I was 14 years old was a call for victory in Vietnam. Hmm. Somebody asked... By the Viet Cong or by the Americans? <laughs> no, American yeah. victory. Okay. Um, somebody asked me the other day, you know, can you name anything you've changed your mind on? Yeah. I said, well, I guess I changed my mind on that. <laughs> um, but it was a while before I really got into the non-interventionist anti-war. That was sort of the last mm -hmm. thing for me. Um, and in fact, it might have helped my transition. I was working at YAF. Mm -hmm. and Young I, Americans for Young Freedom. Young Americans for Freedom. And I was told... Uh, to write a press release endorsing American aid to the African dictator Mobutu. Mm. And so I did because I'm a good employee. Mm. And then, I, as I recall, I mailed it to Ed Crane and mm. said, this is what I'm spending my talent on. Mm. And I think that might have Did you it. use the government mail for that? Yes. Uh, you're just so deep in it. Yeah. That might have prodded him into... Yeah. Uh, offering me a job. So the Cato Institute, where you've spent most of your career, uh, was founded in 78? 77. 77. Uh, and it was uh, located in San Francisco. Right. right? Yeah. So how, how did that come into being and what was its kind of casus belli? Well, Ed Crane was in Washington running the McBride for President campaign in 1976. And he observed that AEI and Brookings, he thought, had a significant influence on limited budgets. Mm -hmm. And he said there ought to be a libertarian think tank, mm -hmm. one representing the values of the American Revolution. And so he talked to Charles Koch, who had money to help. And um, Charles said, OK, I'll put some money up if you'll run it. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you don't want me to run it because it needs to be in Washington, and I'm going back to San Francisco. Mm. Um, and as he used to tell it, I think, Charles was smarter than I was, and he mm. knew if I started this, I would yeah. in a few years realize it should be in Washington. So the idea was to set up a think tank that was neither liberal nor conservative mm -hmm. and that would put libertarian ideas on the policy map mm -hmm. as well as just the pure theory map. What were the what were the big issues in the late seventies that you guys were obsessed with? Well, uh, the big influences in sort of the early seventies were Vietnam, Watergate, and stagflation. Mm -hmm. And I use that trio often to explain why was there an efflorescence of libertarians in the nineteen seventies. Well, the government had just accomplished Watergate. Vietnam Watergate and stagflation, which gave people a very different view of a government that they perceived as having solved the Depression and won World War II. Right. So different generation, that was coming up. Um, what were the main issues? The answer is they're kind of the same issues over and over. It's not, you know, history is not a bunch of new things. It's one yeah. damn thing over and over. Um, for Cato, the original sort of agenda was, well, we're going to take on Social Security, the linchpin mm -hmm. of the welfare state. We're going to take on school choice, which mm -hmm. underlies so many problems. Um, or we're lack gonna, of school choice. Pardon me? Lack of school choice. Yes, yeah. right. Um, and we're going to take on the uh, uh, foreign interventionist state. Mm -hmm. And so early on, we were writing about all of those things. Mm -hmm. Our first real book was about an alternative to Social Security, how to get out of it. Um, one of our first, our, at, at least one of our first papers was on also Social Security. But we had a very early paper on immigration, mm -hmm. um, pro-immigration. Mm -hmm. We had a very early paper on conscription which was a live issue at that mm -hmm. time. I mean, I remember lining up in the hallway of my 
college dormitory listening to the numbers being drawn out of a hat to see who would get sent to Vietnam. Yeah. Um, what uh, is Social Security, you know, unstoppable at this point? This was something that... Uh, that yeah. seems to be the observation all over the world. Yeah. That we've made a lot of progress on free trade. We've made a lot of progress on human rights, civil rights, women's mm-hmm. rights, gay rights. Um, We've made uh, some progress on some micro-regulation issues. We're making some now on housing. We repealed a lot of the New Deal regulations in the 1978 to 81 era. So when people say we're on the road to serfdom, I tell them about all these Mm -hmm. things. We ended conscription. We ended the CAB. Mm -hmm. Um, We ended the ICC. Um, We created a structure that continuously brought tariffs down. Mm -hmm. So all of those things were progress. There was significant progress, and people still say, yes, but what about all this government spending and everything? And I think the answer there is once you create a program that people think they're getting benefits from, very hard to take those benefits away. And we can argue that Social Security is not on net benefiting people, but there's a huge constituents mm-hmm. of people who paid money in and yep. they don't want it taken away from them. Um, and that's true for every program. It's true for the farm mm-hmm. program. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we always say it is so important to stop a new entitlement in the beginning. Because, you know, Medicare was expected to, to cost a billion dollars a year 10 years after it was right. founded. That was crazy. It was much more than that. Right. Um, so you got to stop it. Was it was called the last act of the New Deal. Yes. I mean, it was very, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, you know, politically motivated, uh, the language around it and the rhetoric to sell it, really sold it to people who remembered the Depression. Carolyn Weaver, who wrote our mm-hmm. first economic policy newsletter about Social Security, I don't think it was in that newsletter, it was in a journal article, referred to the people advocating Social Security as the prospective bureaucrats. Hmm. Um, So, yes, there were a lot of people who benefited directly like that. But I think on any government, and in, in yeah. you create something new. You create midnight basketball. And then if you say yeah. we're going to shut down midnight basketball, there's all these people who come out and say, what are kids going to do yeah. then? Well, they're going to play video games. So <laughs> well, okay. we didn't well, know that at the but, time. Well, and that's interesting because, like, midnight basketball was a huge thing in the 90s. This was part of uh, Bill Clinton's uh, war on crime and whatnot. And um, that one doesn't sit, not a lot of bas- midnight basketball programs. I right? think that's so. probably right. And now there, there are problems maybe with all the kids being in video games and, right. and other uh, screen things. Um, but yeah. what, uh, what was in the 80s, what was your attitude towards Ronald Reagan? Because he's somebody within the libertarian movement. And I think this is fading, but uh, Reagan was, you know, really good. He was the best president that we've had. F- a lot of libertarians or people leaning libertarian would say that. Is that right or is that wrong? I would say my own trajectory with Reagan was in the 70s. I was a yaffer. Yeah. And I went to the 1976 convention on behalf of Reagan, not mm-hmm. as a delegate, but just there to cheer him on and everything. And the Young Americans for Freedom was a group that was kind of created by William F. Buckley right. and M. Stanton Evans and a couple of other people. And it was supposedly numerically throughout the 60s, it was bigger than SDS, Students for a Democratic well, Society. Well, I'll let you in on a secret. Yeah. YAF wasn't nearly as big as it advertised, mm-hmm. but that might have been true of SDS, too. Yeah. So. Yeah, okay. um, so I liked Reagan, yeah. and I was actually a delegate to the state convention, I guess, or maybe the county convention for Reagan. Um, and then in 1978, I got hired to work on the Clark for Governor mm-hmm. campaign, and that kind of shifted my allegiance. This is Ed Clark. Ed Clark for Governor. Uh, California, 1978, mm-hmm. first big Libertarian Party campaign that actually had some money and a professional, mm-hmm. a professional staff of me and one other guy. Yeah. Um, and so, as 1980 was coming around, well, now I'm a Libertarian, small L and capital yeah. L, and I went to work for the Clark for President campaign, mm. and I was critical of Reagan. But uh, I remember Roy Childs calling me the great. 
the great autodidact, Roy mm-hmm. Childs, calling me the night that Reagan picked Ford for vice president. Mm-hmm. And, or, 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 or picked Bush. Right. And he said, I was hoping for Reagan Ford because I thought that would be a landslide win and people would know that and therefore they'd be more willing to vote for a third party candidate. Mm-hmm. And I was worried about Reagan and Kemp because I thought that would be a, a campaign that would really emphasize capitalism and right. free markets, and that wouldn't be good for Ed Clark. And so Reagan Bush, that's eh. Um, while Reagan was president, I was a libertarian, and we were pretty much critical mm-hmm. of everything he did. Um, well, not everything, uh, but many things he yeah. did. As time went on and we saw mm-hmm. other presidents, um, I think we got nostalgic for the Reagan-Thatcher era, two people who, if they didn't always live up to it, Mm -hmm. did enunciate a lot of libertarian rhetoric. And I think Thatcher, probably in England, revived British entrepreneurship Mm -hmm. and appreciation for enterprise. And Reagan did some of that, too. I think, uh, to a great extent, Reagan's speeches about Mm -hmm. freedom revived the American spirit maybe as much as his tax cuts did. Right. And, you know, in 75, Reagan uh, was leaving the governorship of California, and he talked to Reese, and this was one of our first big uh, oh, yeah. of interviews. And he said, I've always believed that libertarianism is the heart and soul of c- the conservative movement. And then the rest of the interview is him explaining why. Yeah, but, you know, when it comes to things like gays, uh, drugs, you know, certain types of immigration, like, no, no, you can't do any of that. But it's an interesting... Split, how did the end of the Cold War, did that really sever in a, in a fundamental way and in a productive way the libertarian conservative alliance politically? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I thought at the time that we're going to see a lot of shifting alliances mm-hmm. here because the Cold War has been such a big part of our understanding. And you remember Pat Buchanan said mm-hmm. at the end of the Cold War, okay, we can come home. Yeah. Um, and I thought more people would do that, mm-hmm. but it did, that didn't really well, happen. There, there was a peace dividend, right, in that we brought defense spending yeah. down, but we didn't, we didn't bring the boys home. Right, and yeah. we, we didn't return the peace dividend to the taxpayers. That's we right. spent it on other things. Yeah, like midnight um, basketball. Yes, uh, which, of course, is what some people at Cato and so on had complained about Europe all the time. Mm-hmm. America is subsidizing Europe's welfare state because we, in effect, pay for their defense. Yeah. That means they can afford a larger welfare state. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think it had as much impact as I had hoped. Mm-hmm. But coming after Reagan and Thatcher um, and the continuing growth of free trade, it did seem like a very triumphal moment yeah. that communism has fallen, at least mm-hmm. European communism. It's been completely repudiated. And that end of the spectrum ideologically mm-hmm. is gone. So things have got to shift to the right. Mm-hmm. Uh, in some ways they, they did. Kind of did, right? I mean, in the 90s, we saw, you know, things like NAFTA and free trade. By the, you know, the... Al Gore yeah. defending free yeah. trade. Yeah. Yeah. Like tremendously. And, yeah. and Bill Clinton saying the era of big government is over. Yeah. Um, so, yes, there were... And, well, and the 94 election. Right. The Wall Street Journal on the front page uh, after the 94 election, I think maybe got Bill Crystal to say the themes that the Republicans won on reflect the less government ideas of the Cato yeah. Institute more than the Conservative Heritage Foundation. Hmm. So that was a nice clipping. What, uh, as long as we're stuck in the 90s and particularly 1994, how disastrous ultimately was Newt Gingrich for American politics? Well, yeah, I mean... He's the architect of the Republican Revolution. Right. So first you have to say he was the architect of the first Republican House in -hmm. in decades. Yeah. Um, But I think he probably got delusions of grandeur um, and he... You know, he, he complained about having to walk out the back end of Air Force One mm-hmm. and that sort of thing, and that turned people against him. And in some ways, one of the things he did was tell Republicans to 
demonize Democrats. Mm -hmm. Frank Luntz, I think, you know, helped him come up with the words to demonize Democrats. And maybe that puts us on the road to Trump. Yeah. And I mean, it certainly seems like uh, Gingrich is kind of the mad woman in the attic right now. You know, like we've forgotten about him to a certain degree, but in, in tone and tenor, he's and also I think from a Republican point of view or a conservative point of view, he would talk a big game, but he wasn't cutting spending. He wasn't. Yes. You know, he was. Well, he was there, pretty there was, big there, was a little, there was a little bit, but yes, yeah. not much. You know, Republicans keep throwing out their speakers. Mm -hmm. Democrats don't. The Pelosi yeah. stayed in there forever, and people like Sam Rayburn and Carl right. Albert, they were long-term, much more institutional, I think. Mm -hmm. The longest-serving Republican uh, speaker, I guess, in my lifetime, turned out to be a pedophile. Yeah, so. <laughs> the coach, Coach Hastert, right? Yeah, so they haven't mm -hmm. done a good job with speakers. How disastrous for, I guess, for America and then conceivably for libertarian uh, kind of advances was the Bush, the George W. Bush administration. Well, that was pretty bad. And we, we were sort of optimistic when he came in. I mean, it, yeah. we, you know, we were, we didn't like Republicans. They did a lot of bad things. Mm -hmm. um, but Bush had told Ed Crane that Cato's Social Security plan was on the right track, and right. he wanted to do something like that. And early in his administration, he appointed a commission, which we were sort of opposed to because a commission is usually the way to put an idea to bed. Mm -hmm. But it turned out he appointed a commission of Republicans and Democrats that was stacked in favor of mm -hmm. some kind of privatization. So that was good. But then 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. And everything, you know, Bush got distracted from everything else. Right. Um, and, then, and then he gets reelected and he says, I'm going to use my political capital on reforming Social Security. And it turns out somehow he got reelected, but everybody yeah. hated him. Yeah. We, did a, we did a poll at the time and we said, you know, would you support an idea that would allow you to put your own money into retirement and then not take Social Security at the end? Um, and we got 60% said, yeah, that sounds yeah. good. When we said President Bush has a plan, got 40% approval. Yeah. And it, so that kind of killed it. And he also said the other thing he was going to spend his – because he won big against uh, John Kerry in 2004, and he was going to tackle immigration reform, because which had been idling since Reagan did it in the late 80s. And that lasted about a half a week, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, how bad was it for, you know, and it, and it wasn't just Bush, you know, when, uh, creating the concept of a global war on terror, the Patriot Act, you know, with uh, one or two exceptions, everybody voted for it. It was, you know, a very bi uh, bipartisan consensus plan. How bad was that for libertarian ideas? Well, think? it was definitely bad that, you know, we got the Patriot Act, but also just the general, we have to respond with war. We even have to invade Iraq, which had nothing to do with 9-11, mm -hmm. um, and the Patriot Act and the surveillance state mm -hmm. that was created there. Uh, very bad for the country. Uh, bad for libertarians, too, although it gave us a lot of targets to yep. complain about, um, but... Um, but we didn't get very far in, in aiming at those targets. Did Obama, uh, you know, Obama took office during, you know, the, the biggest economic downturn since the Depression, although virtually every, dep every recession after the Great Depression was called the greatest recession since the Great Depression. Um, but this one was a big deal, and that gave him a free hand. It also gave him, you know, because people disliked Bush and the Republicans, uh, the Democrats came in very strong after the 2008 elections. Um, how, you know, was that kind of, you know, where we were going from a kind of right wing statism to a left wing statism? Was that as bad for libertarian ideas and kind of representing as the Bush years had been? It was easier to raise money against a bad left wing administration. Mm -hmm than it was against a bad right-wing administration. And this is something liberal and conservative fundraisers yeah. know. When your guy gets in the White House, people relax. When right. the other guy gets yeah. in, they panic. Um, in our case, we saw much less of that switch over, mm -hmm. but still, it, it was easier to take yeah. aim at the Obama administration in was fundraising Obama letters. Was Obama particularly, or 
I guess all presidents are bad, and then what are the particular ways? But you know, one of the things when I look back on the Obama years is uh, the rhetoric against him that he, you know, I would hear things people would say with a straight face. He's the first president elected, if you know, if he's actually qualified to be president whose goal is to destroy America as we know it. I mean, there were these yeah. overblown claims against him. But was there something to the idea that he was putting us on a particularly terrible path? Well, I think that kind of stuff is a precursor to what mm-hmm. came later with, with the Trump movement. Um, yes, for one thing, like I said, every time you create a new entitlement, mm-hmm. you'll never get rid of it. And he was trying to create those, and he yeah. had some success. Um, we had stopped Hillary Care. Right. Uh, we were not able to stop Obamacare, and 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 that's what we said at the time. You'll never get rid of it. Mm-hmm. And we kept trying, but we didn't. So yes, he did put us on that bad trajectory. Um, a bigger government than we'd had before, mm-hmm. although every president was giving right. us a bigger government than we and had, had him, before. And with him, I mean, the Bush basically spending uh, went up by 50 percent in real yeah. terms. Um, and there was that massive spike when Obama took office, but then it kind of flattened. But it's, it ha- yeah, I mean, this is a— uh, Well, that's right. He came yeah. in and he had these uh, recover, emergency yeah. recovery plans. Right. And in retrospect, what was that, about $800 billion? Yeah. And then there was a separate eight hundred billion dollar. Maybe that was the health care bill. Um, it seems like chump change. <laughs> yeah. It's and now, weird. yes, uh, Biden just casually passes yeah. a couple of trillion dollar bills. Well, let's. You know, one of the things that you could say about both Bush and Obama is that libertarians could kind of attack them in, you know, it, not necessarily in complete ways, but you know, you could sharpen your attacks on them. And do pretty well. And, and by that, I don't just mean f- I don't mean fundraising. I mean like winning over people. Because, yes, you know they were hypocritical Creating a tea in party. ways, et cetera. So you know, then you get Trump, and how you know did Trump scramble the libertarian movement? And I'm sure you hear this more than me, where people would be like, Trump is the most libertarian president ever. What do you know, what is your best guess of what do people mean when they say something like he that? He scrambled a lot of things. I mean, obvi- it, it looks like, you know, he pulled working class voters in and mm-hmm. he lost some suburban educated voters. Um, and he didn't, you know, he didn't do all that well. He got he got a smaller percentage of the vote right. than Romney had gotten. Mm-hmm. But there was. The, but he won. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, there were. Liber- I had lots of fights. I blocked more people that year on Facebook mm-hmm. than ever before. I had a lot of fights with old friends who said he's most libertarian president. I mean, when he was running. Yeah. And when he was running, I really don't know what it was. Um, he said he would cut taxes. Any Republican that year right. would have been campaigning on tax cuts. Um, he said he would cut regulation. He did campaign against immigration mm-hmm. and against trade. Um, yeah. So I never did understand. I guess he was. A, he said, "Drill, baby, drill." And so yeah. libertarians who thought American energy independence right. or at least uh, production, uh, they liked it. Um, and I think a lot of libertarians, certainly a lot of mm-hmm. conservatives, but I think a lot of libertarians too, liked the fact that he he fights, right. he stands up, he calls the left a bunch of dickheads. Yeah. Um, And I think in the subsequent five years, it occurred to me that the people conservatives and some libertarians are gravitating to are not necessarily the ones who are most conservative, certainly not the ones who are making the most compelling cases. They're the ones who are the most Mm anti-left. So Sean Hannity on Fox, he's just partisan anti-left all the time. Um, Tucker Carlson. Mm Charlie Kirk with Turning Point mm-hmm. USA. Charlie Kirk had been kind of a free market mm-hmm. socialism sucks. That was yeah. his organization. And then he just went all in for Trump. And then I saw other people going all in for Trump. The defense of Trump now as a the most libertarian president, I think, would be tax cuts, 
conservative Supreme Court justices, mm-hmm. who many libertarians think are better than liberal Supreme Court justices, um, and they'll say deregulation. There wasn't that much deregulation, mm-hmm. but there was less regulation than in yeah. a Democratic administration. Yeah, and let's let's talk about uh, Biden. Uh, you know, because Biden now is he? I mean, he has been pretty awful, right? Yes. I mean, both in terms of spending and in terms of regulation. Um, what's the case against Biden? Well, the case yeah. against Biden is he is a bankrupt spender. Um, Trump spent, uh, I think Trump may have spent more in four years than Obama did. Yeah. Um, Biden then comes in and says, I'll yeah, see you and raise right. you. Yeah. Um, so there's certainly that. I think it is also the case, and I understand why some conservatives and libertarians are going to vote for any Republican. Because the best case I heard for Trump from one of my colleagues, I'm not even sure he was making the, a, his own case, he was, he was mm-hmm. saying, Hillary will bring 4,000 dedicated regulators to Washington. I don't know who Trump's going to mm-hmm. appoint. Republican hacks, Ed Fulner's list, mm-hmm. his cronies, but they won't be dedicated regulators. And I think that's definitely happened with Biden, mm-hmm. that his admi- he campaigned as a, as a moderate and uh, compared to either Elizabeth Warren or um, Trump. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he seemed sane, right. moderate, He's a centrist. centrist. Yeah. Um, but he has empowered an administration that wants to regulate everything. Some of it is like woke regulation, sexual harassment on campus, Mm -hmm. hate speech, um, all that kind of stuff. And some of it is just pure economic regulation, and you see it every day. The Biden administration is going to require. The Biden administration Mm -hmm. is going to ban. And one of the problems there, of course, is abuse of presidential power. Every time I see one of those, I'm like, where in the Constitution does it say the president can do that? And, of course, it doesn't anywhere. Uh, So that's I think that's the case against Biden. Foreign policy is more of a mixed bag, and I'm less expert on that. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, but domestically, I think also with Obama, you could say there was this I going back to what I said in the beginning about cosmopolitanism Mm -hmm. and tolerance. Obama comes in, campaigns, he's black, he's the first president to sort of welcome gay people into Mm -hmm. his administration, even though he's not for gay marriage until right right before the 2012 election. Um, But he looks like somebody who believes that everybody is part of America. Trump is obviously the exact opposite of that. Mm -hmm. And with Biden, it's, it's gone way beyond that to... We're letting the DEI woke crowd regulate everybody's life and Mm -hmm. business life, academic life. Mm -hmm. um, People can be canceled. Some guy in California was discovered to have given a little bit of money to uh, the anti-gay marriage forces out there, Mm -hmm. and he was forced to resign as president of Mozilla. Mm -hmm. There was also like, you know, a woman who, 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 who ran a taco restaurant, and she was discovered, because these are public documents, to have given $100 against gay marriage, and she was hounded and boycotted until she lost her job. Now, I was for the marriage. Uh, well, I was against the anti-marriage law. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel very uncomfortable that people take different points, political points of view and can lose their jobs like that. Those, of course, were not the government. Right. But the government is pushing things like that, including strict rules about hate speech and microaggression mm-hmm. and so on. So all of that is the case against Biden. Do you uh, feel, though, I mean, one of the libertarian canards I used to hear when I started at Reason was, well, you should discipline people through the market. So if somebody is anti-gay and you're pro-gay, you know, don't do business with them and, and call attention to their uh, their ideological commitments. Yeah, there's something to that. I, 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 we, we do say we want to discipline mm-hmm. people through the market and then we feel uncomfortable when we do it. Um, I think it's sort of the Twitter mob mm-hmm. mentality. We used to have boycotts, but they couldn't yeah. be as effective because communication wasn't so good and everything. Now uh, you can do that. Mm-hmm. And woman runs a taco restaurant. Yeah. 
if I mean, you know, I really kind of didn't think, you know, I, I'm trying to remember the first time where it's like, okay, well, it really can't get worse than this. But let's just say, you know, uh, uh, Trump versus Hillary Clinton. It's like, okay, these were the two least liked presidential candidates since modern polling. One of them had to win. Now we are looking at something that's worse. You know, Trump and Biden. Biden has numbers that are as bad as Trump's were at the same point in his presidency, even before COVID. Um, kind of really, uh, you know, poured gasoline on everything. What what are libertarians to do? Like, how how do libertarians, you know, because neither of these people, neither of these parties are in any way, shape, or form committed to libertarian principles. Um, you know, how do we maneuver a political landscape such well, as Well, that's one? a good question these days. Um, we tried one thing, uh, some people tried, in 2016, which was to run a presidential ticket composed of two governors, mm-hmm. Gary Johnson and Bill Weld, both well-respected, right. against the two worst candidates in history, and they got 3.5% of the vote. So that didn't seem to work out very well. Mm-hmm. Um, Now the Libertarian Party has fallen apart, so they're not going to do that. Um, I guess you have to pick the party you believe in. Mm -hmm. I I would love to see a fiscally conservative, socially liberal centrist party. Mm -hmm. And I do believe there are millions of voters who think that way, maybe a plurality Mm -hmm. of voters who think that way. but the two parties are controlled by more or less their extremes. Yeah. And how do you break into that? And my colleague, Andy Craig, who, who moved on mm-hmm. to a, another place, um, has thought a lot about election reforms. I've never, I never thought more, much mm-hmm. about them. I always figured, you know, if there's enough libertarians, they'll make themselves felt with right. whatever political system. But maybe something like ranked choice voting, not mm-hmm. so much that it would help libertarians, but that it might hurt extremists yeah. and get more of a consensus candidate. And hey, when I was when I was a young guy, I didn't ever think I'd be looking for a consensus centrist right. country. Can you talk, what about a kind of libertarian culture, a culture of libertarian, libertarian freedom and cosmopolitanism? Are we further along, you know, in many ways, and I know you've written about this, uh, you know, as have I, people at Cato, people at Reason, you know, in profound ways, we are more free as individuals, certainly to express ourselves and to live the way we want to, uh, whatever that is. And many kind of uh, institutions, whether they're public or private of repression, have faded and you can you have more choices in your life. Um, But. Does it, it doesn't really feel that way. It doesn't feel like we are on the, you know, on the frontier of a Well, of I think that's partly expanding. because people always have this nostalgia. You know, mm-hmm. on Twitter, there's all these things about remember when a man with one income yeah, could yeah, afford yeah. this house. He could afford two wives and six kids and a couple <laughs> and dogs. And then economists yeah. come along and say, yeah. adjust for inflation right. and, and adjust for house size yeah. and things. This is not true. Right. Um, plus... You have all the knowledge in the history of the world in your pocket right now. Right. Nobody had that. David Rockefeller didn't yeah. have it in 1990. Um, Michael, Michael Rockefeller could have really used GPS, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah. Um, so part of it is just we always look back and think, oh, things were better and now they're worse. But I do think, I mean, a lot of people know they're freer because, mm-hmm. you know, they're black people who are allowed to aspire to things. Um, I'll tell you, when Corinne Jean-Pierre was appointed press secretary, I wrote a blog post and said, this is a sign of progress. Mm -hmm. A black lesbian could not have been the president's press secretary even maybe five or ten years ago. Mm -hmm. And this is a sign that we're a more open and accepting society. And I got a lot of blowback from Mm -hmm. alleged libertarians saying, She's an affirmative action appointee. Mm -hmm. You're endorsing diversity affirmative action. I said, look, I don't know if she'll be any good, but I'll tell you this. There are positions in your administration you would Mm -hmm. put diversity hires in. I don't believe you make the most visible face in your administration Mm -hmm. an affirmative action hire. It's important how she speaks Mm -hmm. on behalf of your administration. So whether she's good or not, I don't know, but I think they think she is. Mm -hmm. And we see 
more black people, more women being able to rise in corporations mm-hmm. and politics. And of course, as a gay person, in high school in the 60s mm-hmm. and living in a world where I can live with a, a longtime partner and my mm-hmm. friends can get married, and all of this is pretty much taken for granted, yeah. even among conservatives. MAGA is pushing a long-haired gay guy to be RN's Republican National Committee yeah. chairman. Uh, his only little problem is he filmed himself having sex in a Senate office room. Right. But other than that, apparently they were okay with the you gay know, it's thing. It's not like the Senate was using that for any constructive purpose, right? <laughs> well, that's true. Um, so... All of that makes us freer. And then you have written a lot about new forms of communication, Mm. new forms of technology, giving us more freedom. Um, Sometimes I think reason goes too far. That's Mm. just crap. Why is that an improvement in the world? Well, you know, one person's crap is another person's treasure, I suppose. And a lot of the stuff that we didn't save from the olden yeah. days was crap. Yeah. We, we saved Beethoven. But you are, you know, you are kind of a short-term pessimist and not without, you can you can point to things. There is a, it, there does seem to be a vibrant form of a liberalism, a, a kind of Elan Vital. I, this doesn't make any sense, but like there's, a huge surge in a liberalism on the left, uh, you know, which is going deep on identity politics and telling people, well, you can't speak if you don't belong to certain groups or represent certain points of view. On the right, there is a liberalism, you know, a Donald Trump uh, trying to keep Muslims out of the country, irrespective of who they are and what, whatever. And on the right, there seems to be a real uh, push to kind of recreate uh, an America when Donald Trump was, I don't know, 25 or 30 or something like that. Where is that coming from and where does that leave libertarianism? Well, that's a good question. And I've been writing about this, not so much about libertarianism, but about Mm -hmm. liberalism. We live in a liberal world. Uh, Brian Doherty wrote in his uh, History of the Libertarian Movement, a world that now runs on approximately libertarian principles. And you kind of look at that first and say, what? And then you think, Well, yes, the United States, Europe, and more parts of the world are generally based on free markets and private property and on free speech and freedom of religion Mm -hmm. and expanding human rights to people to whom they were denied. And all of that is basic libertarian principles. And okay, we're arguing about gay marriage. And okay, we spend too much money. um, And there's all those things, but we do live in a liberal world. And yet we have these big sets of illiberals on both left Mm -hmm. and right in the United States and in other countries where in countries like Hungary and Turkey and India, Mm -hmm. we're moving away. It's not just Russia and China, Mexico. Um, So my question is, liberalism works so well. Have you Mm -hmm. looked around? Um, Do you realize what your grandparents, your great grandparents had? Even your parents. Mm -hmm. My parents had a black and white TV a long time. Um, I have four televisions well, in my house of two people. Let me, you know, you are a liberal elite, you know, living on the coasts, uh, you know, or libertarian When elite. I was a little boy in Kentucky, I yeah. aspired to be a coastal liberal yeah. elite. Yeah, well, look at you. You know, you're, you're, you're filling that seat. Your former colleague at the Cato Institute, Tucker Carlson, who, you know, at, he went through a libertarian phase, and he was pretty libertarian. But he more recently has said, you know, well— you know, this world has given us more cheap plastic phones, et cetera, but it's not giving us meaning. And that that is, you know, the the crisis in front of us is not one of material resources. It's one of deeper meaning. And this often gets lobbed at liberalism, that it does not, you know, it, it does not reward true believers with one faith and one goal and one God and one mission. Is that a legitimate uh I guess, is it a legitimate critique of liberalism? And then is it like, well, you know what, we need to work with that because that's actually, that's not a, uh, that's not a bad thing. That's, that's a selling point. Well, to some extent, uh, yes, um, it's a legitimate critique. Liberalism is a philosophy of individual autonomy, no established mm-hmm. church, no established ideas, um, let a thousand, well, yeah. <laughs> Mao said let a thousand <laughs> ideas bloom, yeah. but liberalism actually did right. that. Yeah. Um, 
And so, yeah, it's, it's a significant critique, but it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. And we should defend the liberalism that allows people to find meaning in their own lives. Mm-hmm. And preachers and teachers and authors may want to help guide people mm-hmm. to find meaning in their own lives. But we're not all going to find the same meaning. These yeah. Catholic integralists, they think somehow they're going to be able to take power and impose medieval Catholicism on the country. They're not, they're about 20% of the, all Catholics, including right. those who don't go to church, are 20, 25% of the country, and they think they're going to become the philosopher kings. Um, so what we want is people being able to choose their own churches or no church, mm-hmm. choose their own ideas and so on, but we don't want the church, the king, the Vatican, the government imposing a meaning on everybody. And that's what the liberal revolution was about. You know, it was in great part a revolution against the established churches. Um, but, But the question I was getting at is, there's all these illiberals on the left, there's all these illiberals on the right, and yet liberalism endures. Mm-hmm. We do mostly live in a libertarian country, in a libertarian, mm-hmm. uh, liberal country, in a liberal world. So something is attractive enough yeah. about liberal to resist most of these assaults. And I think it is that most people, at least in the United States, do want a world of, of private property and free markets and free speech mm-hmm. and human rights and freedom of abortion and women's rights to, choo- women's rights to choose and to choose jobs. Um, and so they resist the real impositions. Mm-hmm. Um, I recall some, but we, d- we didn't necessarily know that. I mean, it was w- when we think about abortion, which had been a longstanding kind of rhetorical goal of re- conservative Republicans and they got their wish. I mean, they, the dog caught the car and then it didn't work out for them so well. And of course, Republican operatives like Karl Rove had known all along do not yeah. re, do not overturn Roe v. Wade because then abortion will be a political issue in every state, yeah. and in most states we would lose that. Um, I remember a Democratic friend of mine saying reporters um, had been calling him when uh, Justice Souter was appointed and mm. saying, you know, does he have any position on abortion? And it seemed pretty clear that they had picked somebody who didn't. Now, that was mostly to get through the confirmation right. process, but it turned out he also wasn't going to overturn Roe. Yeah. So the politicos knew what was there. The, the, the bourgeoisie were not informed that that was the real plan. What is, uh, you know, as a final uh, kind of question, what, you know, what's, what is the libertarian approach? There's, there's always a dream that the young people, the rising generation, are finally going to recognize that they should be libertarian. And libertarianism is going to be the next youth movement. It's going to be the next thing. Uh, uh, Louis Rossetto, the co-founder of Wired magazine in 1971, I think, in the New York Times Magazine, co-authored a piece of yeah. libertarianism, the next youth movement. We go through this you know, every couple of years. And this time, it's real. It's never fully happened. Um, Can it happen or how important is it to, you know, catch people before they're 30? Well, I think it is important. I think most people do uh, settle into a a set of ideas that way. I think one problem for young people today is we libertarians, or at least we liberals, won so many freedoms for Mm -hmm. them. They're not fighting the draft. Mm -hmm. They're not fighting against the Vietnam War. They're not fighting for, well... They're back to fighting right. for abortion rights, right. I guess. Um, we're we're winning on the drug war. Yep. Um, they, life, don't, they don't have to work after <laughs> school, right? Lifestyle choices, yeah. you know, whether that's being gay or doing drag mm-hmm. shows or um, going back to the land, if that's mm-hmm. your thing. Um, so they they've got a lot of the freedoms that their parents didn't, and they don't realize that. This this generation of mm-hmm. young people, but also the left has really caught a lot of them with this identity politics stuff, mm-hmm. and it started as a very 
noble movement, the civil rights movement, liberate gay people, and then the women's liberation movement, and then the gay rights Mm -hmm. movement, and all of that was about allowing more people to emerge into social and political and economic liberty and equality. Mm -hmm. And then many of us think things went too far, and the wrong people got control of the levers of power, and they can tell you what you can say, and they can Mm -hmm. bring you up on charges because an anonymous accusation was made, that sort of thing. Um, So so how did the left get control of that? Well, of course, people on the left do control the universities. Mm -hmm. They run most of the major media. People always talk about conservative media, liberal media talk about the dominance of conservative media. Are you kidding? All conservative media does is criticize liberal media. Mm -hmm. They don't have any reporters. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe they're getting a little better at that. But, you know, there's no conservative newspaper you would buy to get the news. Um, So that creates a world in which these young people have grown up with these ideas being pushed on them Mm -hmm. and they seem to have accepted them and we haven't done a good enough job of pushing back on that. Um, You know, this will air after this moment, but you are going to speak at the Students for Liberty Conference, which is a group, an international group that started, was started by a former Cato intern. um, And that brings together a couple of thousand young people from all over the world you're talking to them. Can you kind of indicate what, what's the message? What's the, the, the I'm going to say basically message? three things to them, which we've touched on here. One, liberalism is the most successful idea and system ever in the history of the world. You know, it created a hockey stick in living mm-hmm. standards, flat for 10,000 years and then shooting up after, after John Locke and Adam Smith. Yeah. Um, second, We have a problem of illiberalism around the world, and we have a problem of illiberalism lapping at our own movement. We have Mm -hmm. people calling themselves libertarians and telling Holocaust jokes on Twitter and racial jokes um, and cozying up to Trump and cozying up to RFK Jr., Mm -hmm. um, crazy stuff going on, and that is Fortunately, not that much covered by the media yet, but if it ever gets more attention, it will be tremendously disappointing. And so one of the other questions we have to think about is not why are most young people left, but why are so many young purported libertarians alt-right? And I'm not sure exactly what happened there. There's always a market for scapegoating mm-hmm. groups, whether it's the 1% or the Jews or the, yeah. the queers. Um, and that seems to have picked up a lot of people. And, and I do think Trump did a lot of it. Trump sort of lifted, the, uh, lifted Pandora's box mm. and all these things came sliming out. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, they actually attracted people. And, and that's the disappointing part, not that it turns, you know, there were always racists around. Uh, but now they've got websites and they've got podcasts mm-hmm. and there seems to be a market for crazy and reasonable radical libertarianism has trouble, I think, fighting back. A nuanced, you know, Russell Roberts, very thoughtful podcasts are not as big as the Tom Woods podcast where he mm-hmm. rails against the left and and against other libertarians and so on. Um, So there's a market for crazy on both left and Mm -hmm. right, and there is a market for center. And we're finding that at Cato. We're finding that a lot of our donors are saying, we like the fact that you're neither left nor right, you're not falling for the crap on either side, and that you're sticking to principles. And so there are people who who like that. Um, They're hard to organize. For, for one thing, if you have some passion like stopping, queer, you know, stopping trans people or stopping any possibility of hate speech, there's a passion there. Whereas wanting to live your own life and not caring whether other, who other people marry, that is not exactly a passionate idea. You wouldn't march for that. Well, we're going to stop talking on that point. David Bowes, thanks for talking to Reason. Thank you.